you very much, Brett. All right, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, thanks again, Brett, for the great introduction um, and welcome everyone. Um, so as Brett said, my name is Karina Kopp. Um, I am the Information Center Director at the ABMI, um, and I have been with the ABMI for the past roughly nine years um, and have actually been involved in uh, this initiative around Canadian and open avian data kind of since its um, early inception. Um, so I'm just gonna get us started off here um, with a quick overview of why Canadian began and who is all involved. So many of you here today are probably wondering um, what exactly is Canadian, um, or you've actually heard murmurings um, of Canadian uh, over the past year or so. so Canavian was originally conceptualized as this collaborative hub or network uh, where those collecting or wanting to collect Canavian or avian data could find more information about things such as where to store or deposit their data, best practices for data collection, metadata standards, um, available tools and softwares or platforms, um, ways to participate, and so forth. Thus, Canavian, um, the term that uh, we collectively kind of agreed on as a collaborative network. Um, it's not actually a data repository, so to speak, um, but rather it functions more like an intranet um, for avian data collectors, aggregators, and enthusiasts. Um, so the primary intent of CanAvian was to foster those larger collaborations and encourage data sharing in order to advance conservation efforts and expand our knowledge about Canadian bird populations. So given the open data initiative um, that is happening right now and the movement towards making more information um, incredibly available and accessible, uh, we actually hope that Canadian can play this role um, to help enhance avian conservation and knowledge in Canada for creating that network to share and centralize open and accessible information about Canadian bird species, um, including resources and links that help guide folks on where to find the information they need, um, or maybe looking for such as reliable and rigorous data, which can support things such as policy and legislation and sustainable um, stewardship, stewardship decisions, identifying uh, restoring and protecting habitats, opening the conversations about shared natural resource management, and then also aiding in the adoption of industrial practices by using more and better data to inform such decisions. So again, I just want to emphasize, Canavian is not meant to store or house data per se. Um, and this, this is kind of left to the respective repository and data centers that already exist. It's just creating those connections. However, the, the tool and the, the platform itself does seek to actually focus on a few initial areas um, as it relates to avian data, which currently includes things such as avian point counts, acoustic data from things such as or autonomous recording units, radio telemetry data, um, as well as checklists and other occurrence data. So right now this list is limited um, and there is the uh, potential uh, for growth to expand out, uh, which we are open to feedback on. Um, that being said, in providing the means for folks to be able to easily navigate to these various data sets and sources without a ton of Googling, because uh, I know we're all out there on our computers searching for various things that exist out in the the large um, internet, um, it just makes it much easier to get out um, or get to that end goal of data analyses and conservation needs um, for bird species across Canada. Anyways, that is a really quick overview of what CanAvian is, um, which will be launched here very shortly in the near future. Uh, but for now, um, I'll end it with that. And now I'm gonna just pass the presentation over to uh, Melina who is with the Boreal Avian Modeling Project. Thanks, Karina. Oh, 
Okay, it should just load now. Okay, uh, thanks, thank you everyone who has joined in for this webinar. Uh, my name is Melina Ull, and I am the uh, Special Database Manager at the Boreal Avian Modeling Project, also known as BAM. Over the next 10 minutes, uh, I'll present our organization. For those who uh, aren't familiar, I'll talk about our foundational work and how it lies within Canadian. I'll also present some of our recent work and application. So the Boreal Forest support key to biodiversity values, such as large mammal and a very rich, diverse bird communities. Uh, the Canada Boreal Forest has been referred to as the North America Bird Nursery, as one third of the birds we think owes its existence to Canada Boreal Forest. While much of the region remain intact, the Boreal Forest is extremely uh, dynamic, driven by large scale ecological process, such as fire and large scale insect outbreak. It's also known to be a hotspot for climate change, as we are seeing dramatic effect predicted in the Northern region. It is also changing rapidly uh, due to anthropogenic disturbances related to oil and gas industries and the expansion of agricultural land. But the most remarkable anthropogenic influence across the boreal are the forest management and forestry activities. This from the creation of BAM back in 2004 to address some questions and challenges associated with the management and conservation of boreal birds. BAM has a mission of supporting the conservation of North America's boreal birds through high quality, data-driven and collaborative science. And to accomplish this mission and fill information gaps, BAM has worked over the year to build a strong network of partnership with multiple data partners and organization. Those data partners, they vary from independent individuals to industries, academic institution, uh, we have government and nonprofit organization, as well as conservation agencies. BAM's research is designed to have conservation application and to address emerging conservation needs in Canada. And some of our uh, important foundational work that I will briefly highlight is showcased in these two papers here. So all this work and BAM's many achievements are the result of an exceptional and collaborative team, past and present. The BAM team is made up of the uh, four members of our steering committee on the left. We also have project uh, staff, postdoctoral fellow, graduate student, and government contributing scientists. The contribution of the government scientists as part of BAM team brings collaboration and facilitate project alignment with ECCC mandate, which is a major strength of the BAM project. As mentioned earlier, our work relies on a large comprehensive set of data from partners. Lots of time was invested over the years to acquire and harmonize data, uh, bird data to a common standard across the country. We first built an internal database and back in 2018, our database had over 120 projects. They were spread across 150,000 locations and that includes more than 3 million of birds observation. We use that database to develop predictive models on population estimates at the national scale for over 143 land bird species. Those models show how the population are distributed across Canada. With those models, we can predict species specific density estimates and link various environmental variables to their distribution patterns. Like in this example, the output is used to understand habitat relationship for Canada warbler. As, as you can see, the deciduous and mixed wood habitat have consistently higher densities, but that the densities vary between bird conservation region. So the abundant species distribution models are also obviously useful because they provide special estimates that capture broad scale climatic gradients as well as stand level habitat differences. All those efforts 
is to serve the same mission, supporting the conservation of boreal birds through high quality data driven and collaborative science. BAM believe that increased sharing of avian data with as broad of an audience as possible will facilitate collaborative science and accelerate avian conservation and research. And in that regard, uh, we started the migration of the BAM database in 2020 to the online WildTracks platform as part of the Canadian Open Avian Data in Initiative. Over the last couple of years, we revisited and updated data sharing agreement with all the data contributors to enhance the discoverability of the data on the platform. BAM is a founding member of Canadian, and we believe that this initiative will allow us to be connected to a wider network of data portal and providers. The migration of the BAM database to WildTrack has already brought many benefits to us. Data partners can now see their data and discover others using the data discovery tools, which will be presented later. WildTracks host point count data, but also ARUs that can now be integrated together. And WildTrax also allow, uh, can also be queried using the uh, R package called WildAltrax. And all those features we hope will help build partnership between contributors and will ease the identification of areas where research is needed to enhance the bird conservation. To date, BAM has uploaded more than 13 million of birds observation across Canada and north of the US on WildTrax which include the breeding bird survey for which stop location were known. We also provide support to organizations that are interested to publish their point count data on wild tracks by working with them to receive, standardize, and upload new projects on the platform. As for recent work and application, we are currently developing version five of the national density model which we will use to produce prediction at five years interval to estimate specially explicit population trend that incorporates habitat change over time. And we take that opportunity to improve the reproducibility of our modeling process, which will facilitate efficiency, transparency, and consistency for future modeling effort. This reproducibility process has been heavily facilitated by the migration of our data set to wild tracks as well as the transition to cloud-based tools such as Google Drive and Google Earth Engine for data storage and geospatial treatment. The use of those models help us understand the relative uh, variable importance across species to look at the type of variables that are the most important. These importances can also be looked at for individual species by region combination or they can even be drilled down to the shape of the relationship with a particular variable to really understand the stand level habitat relationship. As for some application of our models, uh, we've worked in the past with Becky Stewart and Adam Canfield to compare areas of land bird diversity with area of importance to for priority species like caribou. Uh, we've also been working with Barry Robinson and Nicole Barker and on the Prairies Habitat Joint Venture to compare waterfowl and land bird priorities for the Western Boreal region. Habitat specific density estimates uh, from our predictions have also been applied to land use change simulation to anticipate future habitat value for birds as part of the Western Boreal Project Initiative. And in the Northwest Boreal Partnership, we aim to identify an ecological benchmark to advance landscape conservation across Canada and Alaska. Some of our past rain species density projection were selected as focal species to evaluate potential refugia under climate change. To know more about those projects, you can visit our website or get in touch with us. And I would like to acknowledge our many current and past funding partners, including Environment and Climate Change Canada. And thanks for listening. And I will hand the floor over to Alex.
Thank you, Melina. Hello, everyone. My name is Alex McPhail, and I'm the Acoustic Information Manager at the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute's national affiliate, Biodiversity Pathways. I'm based out of at the University of Alberta here in Edmonton, Alberta, and I specialize in managing acoust extensive acoustic data sets focusing on communicating insights derived from environmental sensor and biological data. Uh, I really enjoy building software and leveraging software tools and data management solutions for species conservation, uh, particularly in the realm of avian biodiversity. And today I'm thrilled to talk to you a little bit today about wild tracks. So over the past two decades, the utilization of passive acoustic monitoring or autonomous recording units, which you may also know as ARUs for birds, has seen significant growth. This method has revolutionized avian research, offering non-invasive techniques for species observation, continuous data monitoring, and the creation of a permanent data record via acoustic recordings. Notably, passive acoustic monitoring increases the detectability of elusive species while at the same time reducing observer bias, making this type of monitoring for bird species both cost-effective and scalable. And in Canada, the groundbreaking research that's been done and the initiatives that were being built through Canadian help to highlight the profound impact that passive acoustic monitoring can have on avian science and conservation. And so six years ago, Wild Tracks was established with directed funding from Environment and Climate Change Canada and other partners to help the acoustic sensor programs manage these vast data sets while also seamlessly allowing uh, data integration across multiple sensors, such as remote cameras, and as Melina mentioned, point counts. Serving as an open platform, WildTrax facilitates data management, storage, processing, and publication of data. And ultimately, WildTrax helps to transform your acoustic recordings from ARUs into species detection. Our network is quite large. It boasts over 300 organizations using the platform across North America, which is comprised of almost 3,000 users and features more than 400,000 unique acoustic locations for which we've just recently celebrated our, our 1 millionth recording, which if you totaled all of that together, comprises about over 11 years of audio data within the system at this moment. Our scope of course is across North America and continuing to grow to help to facilitate more services and functionalities for these acoustic sensor users and services. Membership and access privileges within WildTrax help to empower users and data managers to create organizations and projects for housing their process data. Acoustic processing involves creating tasks from these audio recordings within WildTrax, which can then be enabled with customized settings for focusing processing needs. Dynamic adjustments, such as changing the sampling rate, enhances spectrograms, which are the visual representation of the sound files, helping to provide detailed insights into these vocalizing taxa. You can do double observer observations and verify species to also ensure accurate data processing and tagging. And through the ability of dynamic spectrograms, you can gain more insights about the species you're studying, such as the rough grouse spectrogram that you see on the left side. As mentioned, species verification helps to streamline the review process by allowing batch verification of species tags while simultaneously leveraging tools such as BirdNet, a multi-species avian classifier to help to ensure tag accuracy within the system. Furthermore, project publication options grant control over data visibility to non-members and to the public within the WildTracks platform and system. By switching project statuses to a published state, you can enable data access for media, metadata, and species detections via either the data downloads or data discovery tool. Private data keeps data completely private except to members of the projects and organizations from which they are part of. Map only allows the public to discover locations of data while keeping the report and media private. One step further, uh, map plus report, allows the release of data and locations while keeping the media private and public releases all data. These project statuses then align with the levels in nature counts, which we'll see shortly to actively port the data over correctly. We also offer the R package Wilder Tracks, which facilitates direct download of report data into R environments. 
along with some pre and post processing functions for the various sensors. Um, we also offer this through an Ultimate contribution package and Wilder Tracks welcomes pull requests, issues, and contributors at any time to help to foster that open collaboration data and initiative. As mentioned, our latest feature, the new version of Data Discover, allows users to efficiently search and summarize data across all of WildTracks, from accessing recordings to exploring species distributions. While Data Discover serves as a valuable resource for anyone who is interested in avian acoustics and biodiversity within the system. Data Discover offers advanced search functionalities such as taxonomy, organization, project, species temporal filters, as well as polygon drawing for defining specific boundaries or areas of interest in which you're searching for data. And with up to five customizable layers within the platform, users can compare different searches and view summary statistics through interactive pie charts and bar graphs. Data accessibility is, of course, contingent on membership and project status, ensuring both the privacy and data integrity. However, the release of projects publicly helps to assist in achieving the goal of discovering the data and sharing data at a national scale. And despite WildTracks' vast scale, it's developed and maintained by a relatively small, dedicated team here at the University of Alberta. We welcome questions, ideas, and feedback at any time at info at wildtracks.ca, with issues also being reported to support at, at wildtracks.ca. And our gratitude extends to our partners, sponsors, and users for their continuous contributions to the system. As WildTrax continues to develop and evolve as a vital platform for avian biodiversity research and conservation, we're helping to shape the future of environmental monitoring and species presentation. And from there, I'll pass it over to Kyle, who'll tell you a little bit more about nature counts. Kyle, you're on mute. Uh, you know, it's like I've never used Zoom before. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. And thanks, Alex. It's great to be here with you this afternoon. Uh, my name is Kyle, and I work uh, for Birds Canada, in particular with the platform called Nature Counts, uh, which is what we'll chat about for the remainder of our, our presentation here this afternoon. And I'll tell you a little bit about what Nature Counts is and uh, how it works and how it fits under this umbrella of Canadian. Uh, so the first thing that you need to know is that Nature Counts is a program of Birds Canada, and it's an open data platform that collects data on birds in Canada. So in a way, you can think of it as a big database that pulls in as much data as it can on birds here in Canada. But it's not just a repository. It's very much a two-way street. So it's pulling in data, but it's then turning those data around, excuse me, and making them accessible to anyone who's trying to work towards the conservation of birds and their habitats in Canada. Now, those data come from a, a huge array of different sources, uh, from all sorts of research and citizen science projects, both current and historical, um, certainly from wild tracks and from BAM through wild tracks, as you've heard already, uh, but also from lots of different projects, including things that are big and broad, like eBird, and things that are very narrow in their focus, like provincial breeding bird atlases or single species surveys, like the Canadian Lakes Loon Survey. Uh, these projects are varied in their, their scope, their geography, the species they focus on, and also their uh, methods and their protocols. So they might include point counts or uh, recording units. They include area searches and checklist surveys. They include call playback and stop within route surveys, all kinds of different protocols. And so what Nature Counts does is it takes in all those data, it hosts the data and sort of interprets it, and then acts as that point of connection or that link between the people and the groups who are collecting the data and the people and groups who may use the data for conservation and research, whether that be things like assessing the status of species, uh, land use planning and protecting spaces, informing policy, or any other sort of conservation work and research that you can imagine. And so Nature Counts is right there in the middle, connecting the data collectors and contributors to data users. Uh, the data arrive at Nature Counts in some different ways. We do have uh, an app, so there's a, a number of current projects like breeding bird atlases and uh, nocturnal owl surveys that are collecting data in the field on the app and submitting instantaneously from the field. So you can imagine the turnaround time between collection and availability of those data is very, very fast. Um, some projects may not be using the app, but may be using online data entry portals. 
And we also receive completed data sets from projects that are no longer active. They can be uploaded all at once. Uh, so for example, you know, here where I am in Ontario, we're in the middle of our third breeding bird atlas, which is submitting data on the app and the, the web portals. But the first atlas was back in the 80s. And so that predates obviously nature counts and those data have been uploaded all at once. So that historic data is in the platform as well. And then we are regularly receiving uh, data through import from partners like WildTracks, like eBird and things like that. So all of these things work together basically to amount to a huge pile of data. There's tons and tons of data in Nature Counts. Uh, this figure is, is last year, so it's actually a little bit out of date already. Uh, but right now there's well over 235 million uh, bird occurrence records in Nature Counts, which is a lot, obviously. Uh, this figure actually says that they come from 680 data sets, but that number is currently up over 900 data sets, um, bringing this data to Nature Counts in large part because of uh, recent imports from Wild Tracks. So already that collaboration is really uh, contributing in a big way to the growth of Nature Counts. Um, so it's big, it's big and it's growing. And the point of that, of course, is not to, to amass a big pile of data or to be able to brag about big numbers, but to have that data used as much and as effectively as possible for the conservation of birds. In order to do that, we're always striving to make sure that Nature Counts abides the FAIR principles, the FAIR principles of data management. And those principles are a set of guidelines which tell us how we can make sure that these data can be used as effectively and efficiently as possible. So first and foremost, we need to make sure the data are findable. Uh, already, you can imagine that by grabbing data from hundreds of different projects and bringing them all in under one umbrella, one user-friendly umbrella, where we're contributing to the findability of those data. And then we need to make sure that we raise awareness of the platform and bring people in so that they can find the data that they need. Uh, once we will find the data, it has to be accessible. So we have to have a good barrier-free uh, process for getting your hands on the data once you've found what you need. They need to be interoperable, especially with data coming from all those different sources and different data sets. They need to all work together in your analysis and in your workflow so you can sort of uh, work with them together and they need to be reusable so it's not a matter of i collect data for my project i use it for my analysis and then it goes off in the corner and never gets seen again uh, it's a matter of how can we continue to use the data and extract more value from the data um, all the way into the future so to make sure we abide these principles nature counts has a fairly rigorous set of data standards uh, first and foremost that entails comprehensive metadata so metadata is a set of information that comes with each data set that tells you about the scope of the data, when and where and how it was collected, who owns it, and whatever else you may need to know to use it effectively. So all of the data in Nature Counts has that context, that information that you need to make sure that you can use it to the fullest. And we need to make sure that those data are formatted in a consistent way. You can imagine with all of those different protocols and all of those different projects, we need to make sure that when you download, when you access this data, even if you're accessing five, six, 50 different data sets, uh, the formatting is all the same and you can use them together. So all the data in Nature Counts are formatted using a, a standardized system called the Bird Monitoring Data Exchange. It's a standard set of fields so that all the data when you access it looks the same and it can be used together uh, interoperably and interchangeably. We're always trying to find a balance between open data sharing and data security. Uh, Nature Counts deals with a lot of species at risk records. It deals with records of sensitive spaces, private property, uh, from groups that are, might be concerned about data sovereignty. And so we're always looking for that perfect balance. Data contributors to Nature Counts, they retain full ownership of their data. So Nature Counts doesn't own the data. The folks who contributed the data, they own the data, and they are able to dictate how those data are accessed and used. Uh, the biggest way they do that is by selecting a level of access, and Alex did allude to levels of access in Nature Counts and how they correspond to the permissions uh, in Wild Tracks. So that might mean, you know, your data is totally open and people can grab it whenever they want for whatever use, or it might mean that the data requires a request and to have permission granted by the owner uh, and, and everything in between. So selecting that level of data access and retaining ownership over the data really helps to keep it secure while making it as open as possible so that it can be shared and used. And then finally, we provide tools, tools to access the data, to visualize the data and to, uh, to use it. And for example, if you go to the Nature Counts website today, you can pull up some lovely maps. Uh, you can look at maps of breeding evidence. For example, uh, this is the breeding evidence map for Canada Jay. And you can see all the little squares, the little UTM squares. 
uh, which indicate bringing evidence, red for confirmed and orange for probable and yellow for possible, um, something familiar if you've ever participated in a breeding bird atlas. And if you zoom in and you start clicking on squares, you can get more resolution and more detail about uh, that information. You can also view trend information. So here's a, a trend map for the Canada warbler uh, with little dots, the red ones indicating declining trends and the blue dots indicating increasing trends. So you can see where a Canada warbler is doing well, where it's not doing so well. You might be able to start to pick up regional patterns that can inform your work. And then once you've sort of had your fill of visualizing the data, we've got a, a very easy data download tool as well. So you can filter the data by the species that you're interested in or the project or data set that you want and by the date range. You can even select uh, with a customizable polygon, just like on Wild Tracks as well. So if you're working on a small location where maybe a development is happening or you're concerned about land use in a certain area, whatever the case may be, you can draw a tidy little polygon and you can get exactly the data you want and none of the data that you don't. So it makes it as, as simple and easy as possible to get your hands on exactly what you're looking for. And we do have an R package as well, so not to be outdone. Uh, for those R users out there, there is an R package, so you can pull the data directly into your R workflow uh, and analyze it and work with it as easily as possible. So hopefully that gives you a, a sense of what Nature Counts is and how it works in a nutshell. Of course, it's a lot to explain, but uh, but I think that covers at least the basics. And uh, and we've alluded a little bit through there as to how Nature Counts and Canadian really fit together. And I think in many ways it, it's a fairly obvious fit. Um, but we're very excited about Canavian and the fact that it, it opens up these obvious data pipelines. So data can flow freely in both directions uh, between the collaborators in Canavian, which provides a lot of exciting opportunities to collaborate and uh, to work together towards conservation. We're able as well at Nature Counts to bring to the table some of the tools that we've developed, like our data collection tools, our, our mobile app, for example, which can be made available to Canavian partners. Um, and Canavian in turn has supported the development of some of those great tools for data access. So that support of this network has been really, really uh, incredible and instrumental in developing those tools. And finally, I think just more broadly, um, our goals are all the same. So with Nature Counts, Canavian, we share those goals of, of making data more available and more accessible to conserve birds in Canada. Um, so it's a perfectly logical fit and we're really excited to see uh, what the future of this collaboration holds. Um, if you're interested in learning more about Nature Counts, you can visit naturecounts.ca. You can check out those maps and those data visualizations and uh, and get your fill. Uh, and with that, I think I'll turn it back over. That's uh, that's it for me today. I think I'm probably turning it back over to Brett. Hi, yeah. Um, just going to stop the recording here. Um, 